Mike Ranta, the pride of Atacokan, Ontario, is the world's first solo canoeist to successfully traverse the North American continent in one season. For 200 days, Mike paddled with only his dog, Spitzy, to keep him company. From Vancouver to Cape Breton, Mike has witnessed the rugged beauty of the Canadian wilderness and the destructive nature that our industries can have on our watersheds. Mike's primary goal was to raise awareness for the many challenges that face our Canadian veterans. Mike's love of country and the generations of men and women that continue to serve and protect Canada runs deeper than the waters of Lake Gichigumi. I caught up with Mike on the shores of the Kitchissippi River in Pembroke, Ontario. I hope you enjoy his story. I like to describe myself as a modern day voyageur. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a solo canoeer. I'm the first guy to cross the North American continent solo by canoe in one season. I definitely got some kilometers behind me. <laughs> I did this, uh, this trip here for uh, in my 2016 trip for our veterans. And uh, I just wanted to say thanks, especially to our World War II men and women. You know, it's a generation we're losing fast and I, I really wanted to say thanks to them. You know, they're an amazing group of people talked to a lot of American soldiers that were out there uh, uh, fishing and they said the one thing they feared was a Canadian soldier. It was when they when they came into ground you knew it. The steps were heavier. There was a pride. There was something thick there and everybody stepped aside because they knew these guys were gonna get the job done. Hell or high water. You know and there's so many stories out there and they weren't guys to brag about it. They just did it. They just did it for country. They did it for family. They did it for friends. Amazing people. Amazing. Uh, the first guy that always comes to mind with me is when I was walking in BC. I was walking down, uh, walking down toward Caramillos, and this uh, this little blue uh, blue truck pulled up. You know, it was one of the, uh, an old Chevy. I always liked them trucks. You know, it was uh, the late 70s, early 80s. Anyway, this this old guy came out and uh, introduced himself. He said, you know, he had a little bit of a limp and said he was 80 years old and he really appreciated what I was doing and it, it was it was a lot of fun you know uh, we started talking and I said well where'd you serve you know and he goes well actually I couldn't medical reasons with my feet he said I couldn't he said but my dad's in the truck he said would you mind saying hello to him you know come <laughs> your dad <laughs> he's 80 right so how old's your dad 98 years old and uh, so yeah I, I took off a piece of the canoe and and walked it over to him. He had mobility issues, of course, eh? And, but spry. Like, I mean, he was just an amazing guy that way. He was really, uh, yeah, he had that sharpness to him. He was first wave in on Normandy. He lost 83 men in one day. It was, it, what, what an amazing story as he, as he explained how he, he was walking right there. You could see it in his eyes, you know, that, that fear still, that, that drive, you know, and he, he, re, he was reliving it when he was telling me. And, and yeah, how he went up to get the nests, machine gun nests. You know, it was his job. It was their job. Telling me how he branched away from him and five other guys, or six of them, made, made, made a run for it. And, uh, you know, he uh, said three of them only made it. You know, two by shrapnel, one by sniper, he said. He started naming names. And I was thinking to myself, wow, I, I, was, I was crying. You know, so was his son. And uh, yeah, it, 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 was, it was a pretty emotional moment, you know, and that's when I knew that, wow, this, uh, we're, we're doing something pretty fantastic here. I also asked him about the positive aspects. I said, what was the best, you know? Some men and women he worked with. He started telling me prank stories and all this other stuff they used to pull off. And it was a great conversation, you know. We we laughed at the end of it, you know, because I, I wanted to hear something positive what he got out of, out of our military, you know. And, and that, that that was that that was probably one of my most memorable conversations. And as I walked back with his son again, there he walked walked me back to the canoe, and I was just yeah, I was in absolute awe of these two men. You know, we got a hundred. <laughs> 100 and some years of experience, 178 years of experience sitting right in front of me, you know. 
and it's pretty humbling when you get people saying thank you and doing a good thing. You know, that's, I, I knew we were doing something special. And, he, and his son told me that was the first time he, he had heard his father tell that whole story sober. And that was, that was, that was pretty emotional. So I, I think even after uh, 80 years of being together, I think when he got back into that truck, they, they made a new connection and a new respect. And that was, that was pretty Canadian. That got me up that mountain that day. I did, I, 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 really, I really strode those poles in my canoe with pride there. So did Spitz. Yeah, he was a real hit, they loved him too. <laughs> Another fella I met on the Winnipeg River really stuck out, he was from Hitler Youth. And uh, I was just paddling along there and I seen this old white haired fella, so I stopped in there and we were talking away and I noticed he had a pretty thick accent still. And uh, I told him what I was doing and everything and he was kind of, you could tell he was, you know, kind of uncomfortable a little bit, eh? And I was just like, you know, did you ever? he said, honestly, he said, I was a POW, he said, here. He said, I was from Hitler Youth. He was taken in when he was 13 years old. Family killed. So he's seen his cousin shot right in front of him. And uh, as we talked about it, and uh, he, had, he, had a, he had a pretty spry sense of humor. He was saying, man, he goes, I, I got into it with the Canadians. He said, a grenade went off, knocked me out. I come to, he said, there's three of them. He said, well, that's it, I'm dead. They're gonna kill me right here. Well, they didn't. He said, they hauled him up, stripped him down, got him out of the uniform, <laughs> started peppering questions at him. And he said he didn't, you know, he was scared. He said, he said whatever he could. He said, cause he was told on his side that they were gonna, they were gonna burn him and skin him and all kinds of stuff to get the information, like, you know, and you know, probably back in the day, it wasn't far off, you know, like, I mean, they were pretty desperate on the information they wanted to get out of people. And uh, so anyway, they had got him into smocks and everything, went from Belgium and then went over to England and they thought, wow, you know, when are they gonna do it, you know? <laughs> then they told him they're shipping him to Canada. So we thought, wow, why are they gonna bring me all the way to Canada to kill me? He thought, well, I'm going into a mine or <laughs> something like that, or a factory. And they put him on the Winnipeg River. And you know, it, it was funny, I always told the story, because he got there and there's guards, and there's uh, Italian in there, there was Japanese. He said when he uh, started <laughs> looking around, he said there really wasn't much of a fence, you know, <laughs> there's guards, but he said, well, it probably wouldn't be too bad to get out of here, but midsummer on the Winnipeg River, <laughs> when that sun went down, he understood why nobody ran in the bush. <laughs> there was lots of bears then, there was lots of animals kicking around, or uh, lots of bugs, like that would be the biggest one. The Winnipeg River is phenomenal for the bugs. So that was a major deterrent for all of them to run away. But yeah, he said then at the end of the war, he said he was just about 18, and uh, or just turned 18. And he, yeah, he said the, the war was over and he, he didn't go back. He stayed. He had really nothing to go back to. And he just thought this was an amazing place. He kept in touch with the soldiers he, uh, that, re that rescued him, as he put it. And uh, yeah, it was, it, it was a pretty cool moment. So I, when I got him to sign my canoe, he was like, what? <laughs> he said, if there's ever a Canadian veteran, you know, the, the, that, that was a man who had a pretty unique story and who loved his country, you know, a second to none. You know, he did, he absolutely appreciated what we had here. Yeah, there, there's, there's lots of people like that we met along the way. Yeah, amazing people. Okay, we just seen a cow and twin calves here, and one twin calf just bailed into the water over here, and I don't know where he went. I'm kind of nervous because I don't. This is not a very uh, deep creek here, and if Mama comes around, oh my, the little fella's trapped. Oh my, I do not want to be here. Okay, I gotta help him. I gotta help this little guy, he's trapped. Okay, just hang tough, Spitz. Okay, wow. Um, he's drowning here, I gotta get him out of here. 
I gotta get him. I gotta help him. Oh boy. It's okay, little one. It's okay. It's okay. I'm gonna help you. I'm gonna help you. Look at him. Look at him. He's right here. He's just little. Right. He's going under. He's going under. I can't. Come here, you. Come here, you little fella. Okay, it's okay. It's okay. I got you. I got you. It's okay, little one. I'm going to help you here, okay? Okay. Wow, moose rescue. I never thought I'd be doing this. Okay, I got him by the ears here. Okay, here we go. He's just a wee little fella. Oh, my. Okay. Mama! Oh, it's okay, Spitz. It's okay. It's okay. Come on, little one. It's okay. It's okay. We're going to get you out of here, okay? We're going to get you out of here. Can you, can you get up? Oh boy, oh boy, okay, uh, okay, okay, in the canoe, in the canoe, okay, okay, little moose, it's okay, little moose, Spit, you stay, okay, whoa, okay, off he goes, okay, he's a, he's a pretty decent swimmer, we got you out of that jam, hey, you gonna be okay? I know the most dangerous thing, okay, I'm gonna get out of here, he seems to be all right, he'll start calling here in a little bit, and, uh, Hey, I'm glad I helped you, okay? Just be a little bit more careful next time, okay, little fella? You're okay. Okay, I'm gonna get out of here because if Mama Moose comes back in here, I'm gonna get one hell of a licking. Spitz! Hey! It's okay. He's one of us. Okay, well, if I know my, my moose there, Mama didn't go too far. She's probably just over here. Once he starts crying a little bit there, in which he will, she'll come back and get him. Oh, wow. You know, it's like I said, it's just some crazy things happen in this, uh, in the bush and, you know. <laughs> oh, what next? <laughs> eh? Seen a pile of otter today. Seen about half a dozen raccoons. Rescued a baby moose. Ah, great Canadian day. <laughs> I have a brother in, uh, that's in Edmonton and a uh, good guy. He, he was in Bosnia in the 90s and that was a pretty rough time. Yeah, Bosnia and Sarajevo and around that area and then it, it, was, it was a pretty rough goal, you know, even as a peacekeeper. And uh, yeah, you know, it's, uh, he, he's having a hard time with it sometimes, you know, there, there's, there's a guilt there that we can't, we can't comprehend, you know, and, and you could see it. But you know, he's getting better, a little bit of love and compassion and, uh, you know, and, and that's what it takes to, to help these guys. You know, we're losing 22 guys a day between the United States and Canada for suicides. And uh, a lot of it is mentally, you know, it's, and it's the programs they got to go again. For these guys to get help, the paperwork they got to go through is sickening. It's sickening. It's broken. And a lot of times if they don't dot an I or, or cross a T, it's they're right back to the very beginning of it. Uh, for a man or woman who has mental issues, that's devastating. Rejection is devastating especially when it comes from the very people who promise to protect them. And a lot of them just feel helpless and, uh, and desperate. And that, that's where we're seeing them go. Got men, men and women with families, young kids. Uh, you know, it's hard to fathom, but they're so desperate and they feel burdened. Like they feel like they're a burden on society now. And they've got such immense pride. Uh, it, it's that pride is why, why we're here, why we have a Canada. And we need to step up and show them that we're proud of them, too. You know, there's nowhere else in the world I could go this distance without having a gun pointed at me or asking for some sort of papers. I never had that at all. In fact, the police officers I met along the way were awesome. They were good. They were, they were pretty amazing people. A lot of them were jaw dropped in what I was doing and whenever they could, I had guys give me a hand with a flat tire, uh, uh, bringing me coffee, you know, and signing my canoe. Uh, it was amazing, you know. They're, I never felt the threat, you know. <laughs> I wasn't the greatest of people all the time when I was younger, so I was just as guilty as, as anybody when it, when it comes to police officers in Bad Mountain. But then you realize, you know, when, when you got friends that are, that are officers and you have an understanding of what they go through in the run of a career, Wow, yeah, respect is needed. I could see why sometimes I get a little frustrated. 
but you know they they are in general they're good people you know and i think it's showing that little bit of again love and compassion smile hug a handshake goes a long ways in this country you know it's beautiful Well, I, I explain to people, my, my ancestral background is I'm Finn and Métis. So I tell people I'm half Finn, half French, and half Ojibwe. <laughs> it takes a man and a half to paddle across the country, I say. But, but yeah, you know, for the, for the Finnish part of it, it, uh, it gives me that, uh, that stamina, that strength that the Finn have, that sisu. That it, it's very unique energy. Uh, the French, that gives me that laugh in my heart. You know, that laugh and song that gets me, that gives me that good positive attitude that even in the toughest times, I still get to whistle and, and sing. And uh, the Ojibwe in me, that, that gives me that connection to the land. That is, you know, this, uh, I really feel it. You know, when you, when, you, when you soak in the waters and you feel the dirt in your hands and the wind in your hair and the, and the fire, and, you know, it's just, uh, it, it's an amazing feeling. You know, and we do, uh, you know, surprising, they, they lived here for thousands of years and you'd never know it. You know, you, uh, the way they carried themselves, they coexisted with nature, so they could keep going. You know, we're, we're, we're looking at our 150th anniversary here, you know, and uh, we've been here for well over 400 years, you know, as, as coming over to North America. And look at the damage that has been done, irreversible. You know, uh, going through the Coppell Valley, Buffalo Pound, 15 million gallons dumped into a small river system of raw sewage. I mean, how embarrassing, that whole native settlement all the way down river because they, they, didn't, they didn't want to spend the money on cleaning it. They just assumed it's, it's cheaper to dump it into the river and make all these people sick that they have nothing to do with. That's what I mean, it seems to be passed down. Grassy Narrows, you know, that was right close to our hometown. These are our watersheds. We gotta start realizing that if we don't have good water and good air, it don't matter how good our economy is, it don't matter how many dollar bills you put in your back pocket, dead's dead, sick is sick. That's our health. Our health begins with what we put into us. Firm believer of that. And it was, yeah, it was, it was embarrassing again some, in some places. But there were some other places you've seen were just, wow, how clean it is. You could taste the water in it. You could smell it in the air. But it seemed to be when you got by the city centers that with the runoff, I came down to those waters. Edmonton was, a, was another example. As I went through there, like there was a scum on my canoe. You know, it was good waters right up till I got to that big city center and then there's signs were up there, do not, don't eat the fish. You know, it's, we, we didn't inherit this. You can't buy the land. We're, we're borrowing it from our children. You know, the, the future. And we're supposed to take care of that. You know, and we, we are, we're failing it. Pipelines. All this. I, I worked in the oil industry for 18 years. I, I seen how they work. I seen how they work. It's uh, they uh, they set their own they set their own uh, fines. So at the end of the day, they will say, "Yeah, if we don't do this, we don't clean it up. We're going to pay these huge fines." Well, it's cheaper for them to pay the fines than to clean it. It's only good business practice, you know, to say, "Here you go," and then we're stuck with it because government essentially, I'll say it, they get paid off. You know, uh, we, we can't keep destroying our planet. It's just not feasible. It just isn't. Uh, like I said, you can have all the money in the world if you haven't got fresh water and good air and people to love and care for. What have you got? It's, it's not sunshine and lollipops out there all the time. It's not just paddling down a river and, and experience rainbows and all this, man. Yeah, you bet it, it's dangerous. Uh, weather is your biggest danger. Uh, you got some serious storms coming in and it's in places here on a river um, and everybody has seen this in the news and how fast these rivers flash and flood so you really got to watch how you place yourself um, yeah, yeah the dangers are, are very real the rapids um, but one of the biggest dangers i got is with spitz you know i really got to watch how he deals with animals also you know he's, he's an amazing dog when it comes to uh when it comes to critters but uh you know, you can only do so much. You know, that one time we, we flipped the canoe on the Cam River and we lost him and uh, he, he got to shore. Uh, we both did, I tied off the canoe and it happened to be into a pack of wolves. You know, it's just one of those elements we got. He, he either got put the run on or he, uh, he ran to drew him away. Uh, but either way, I lost him overnight and I, I couldn't tell you the roller coaster or ride of emotions I went through, you know, after having my best friend for eight years in the bush and all of a sudden gone, you know, and, uh, and for what, you know? 
And yeah, it was uh, it was pretty discouraging. It was pretty uh, pretty hair raising. And then we found him uh, two kilometers down the way. I didn't find him. My uncle Bert found him and uh, brought him back to me. I had half a Thunder Bay beating down the bushes there. They really came out of the woodwork. I always joke. My cousin jokes with me that I think more people would have came out looking for him than me. <laughs> so it was, uh, you know, there there are elements out there. You know, uh, you know, it's it's just well you place yourself and and. Uh, and where you're at and it's, it's keeping good sense and hunkering down at times. But yeah, I would say that the biggest element you got to deal with is, is weather. I've, uh, I've got indirectly hit by lightning on the Winnipeg River two years ago. And that was, that was a scary, scary situation. It, it drained the energy right out of me. I fried my camera and my flashlight out in the canoe and Spitz got nailed in the paws and he was hurt. And yeah, it was, uh, it was a pretty desperate moment. Wrong place, wrong time. But uh, yeah, it's... Uh, you know, I, I love it. it. It's a challenge, you know, and uh, it's, it's not an easy task by any means. You know, it's putting in long hours in a day and, uh, but you know, it's, uh, there's nothing more beautiful than a, than a Canadian sunset and a Canadian sunrise, you know, and sometimes that's all you get at the end of the day is just that sunset. But you know, man, it's a beautiful sunset. <laughs> you really learn how to appreciate it. Yeah. Stay strong, stay true and paddle your own canoe. <laughs> So take me right from the beginning to the end. Okay, well, uh, I started in Vancouver. I, went, I, I left uh, in Richmond at the, at the memorial for the fishermen, and I headed up to Fraser. I paddled up to Fraser to Hope. I then walked over the Cascades, over into the Similkameen River in there for half a day. And then I walked over uh, to Soyuz Hills and eventually made my way up to Nelson. Nelson, then up to Kootenay Lake, then to Creston, and then walk from there over to Crow's Nest Pass. I took the Crow's Nest River into the into the Old Man River, the Old Man River into the South Saskatchewan, the South Saskatchewan into Lake Diefenbaker. I then branched east and took the Coppell Valley and the Coppell River all the way to the Assiniboine to St. Lazar, and then took the Assiniboine all the way to Winnipeg and got into the confluence there of the Red River, the Red River all the way into Lake Winnipeg. Um, Around the southern shore, of the southwest or the southeast shore of Lake Winnipeg, around through Victoria Island or Victoria Beach, up through Traverse Bay, up the Winnipeg River to Kenora into Lake of the Woods. Took the high water Voyageur routes. That's my stomping grounds in Atikokan, and uh, took the old Voyageur routes to uh, to the the Big Lake, Gitchigumi, Lake Superior. Took the north shore of that all the way to Sault Ste. Marie, through the locks into Georgian Bay. Um, Took the shores all the way to the French River, up the French River into Lake Nipissing. Uh, Lake Nipissing, I, I did the, the Heideland Portage into Trout Lake. That brought me into Pine Lake and then into Talon. And then took the Mattawa River into the Ottawa, down the Ottawa into the St. Lawrence. Uh, pulled out just before Riviere de Loup. Uh, Portage over to Lake Timiskata. Uh, took the Madawaska River down into the St. John River. Uh, turned north <laughs> at Lower Cambridge, up the Canada River, got out till I, I paddled up there till I ran out of water, and then portaged from there through Moncton and over to the Shadiac. Took the coast to Cape Breton, and then through the Bredore Lakes, through St. Peter's, and then come out at Sydney and uh, made my way around the corner and portaged over to uh, uh, River Ryan, and then paddled across into Dominion. And uh, Bob's her uncle, she was done deal 200 days later.